turn to being a host. So this year, we're thrilled to have Seneca hosting the conference. So once again, if you're interested in taking advantage of this conference and attending, then go to advancinglearning.ca. Um, you can find out more about the cost, logistics, and uh, a program will also be posted uh, at some point on that website. So hope to see you in person at the Advancing Learning Conference. One last thing on the educational technology website, I also believe, I mean, there's a bit.ly or a bit do link here if you want to keep apprised of what webinars are coming up, then you can do it through this, this link. Also, you can go to our main website and there's an option to sign up for the mailing list there as well. Okay, so what I would like to do is I'll just check in just to see how we're doing. And it looks like uh, slowly individuals are getting online. And uh, oh, so we have a question from Mary. So Mary mentioned from Seneca that session proposals are being accepted for advancing learning. So thank you for raising that point. And so as another reason to go to the advancinglearning.ca website, I'll just bring that up once more, which is here. So advancinglearning.ca. And there is an opportunity to submit a proposal and to be a presenter at the conference. So I am going to switch out my presentation. So just give me one moment to do that. Okay. And at the same time, I can see our numbers just keep increasing. So that is just amazing. So thank you once again. Okay, so then I'm just going to go ahead and we'll jump into our session. So, PowerPoint as a design tool for learning. So, as a structure for what we're going to talk about today, I'm going to conduct most of this in a presentation kind of format, only just because it saves a bit of time, but I will try to make it uh, interactive at times. We'll probably need to keep most of the questions towards the, the end, only uh, because, again, I think that'll be a more efficient way uh, of going through our session and addressing, addressing questions without um, things taking a long time. So I'd like to, bring, to begin this session by thinking about cognitive load. So if you look at this image, I think a lot of us can relate to this image, to this sense of feeling overwhelmed by information, especially we're getting towards the middle of our spring semester. I think, you know, we've had a long academic year. So I think that certainly weighs in. But just in terms of information, we are in a society where we're just overloaded with information. So you can imagine from the student perspective, especially at this point in the year, that you're feeling just overwhelmed and assaulted with information constantly. And when you're feeling this level of, of being overwhelmed, then at some point your brain, your, your brain does start to tune out. And Hello. it becomes... Can anyone hear? Um, so I'm just going to pause for a moment. Uh, sorry, let me get back to. So uh, yes, uh, we did hear you. And um, yes, yeah, so we're just underway. So I'm just going to ask that uh, we have our microphones turned off. That would be much appreciated. Thank you. OK, so. Basically, cognitive load is that experience where we are just so overwhelmed by all the amount of information that we're receiving that it's really hard to stay focused and to decipher what is most important. Now, factor this into, you know, 
what we know about our learners and that attention spans are especially short. So basically to say this in a sciencey way, cognitive load is essentially the mental effort to process information. So it's the effort it takes, even like moment to moment, slide by slide, the effort it takes to absorb information. We also know that with attention spans being so short, you can imagine that it's easy to miss certain important details in the moment when you're not paying attention to what's happening around you. And I think we're all guilty of this. I'm certainly guilty of it. If you're watching television with your partner or your friend, but you're also looking at your phone, so maybe you're browsing social media, so you're watching something, and then all of a sudden something happens in the show, and you're like, what just happened? What did I miss? And then your companion gets a little bit annoyed with you because uh, you were on your phone and not fully attending. So I think we know that attention is really critical to learning. So basically, it comes down to this. We learn what we attend to. So this means that our job as presenters is that we have to guide students to know what to pay attention to. So moment by moment, slide by slide, we have to help learners know what to focus on and to make sense of the information that they're seeing at that time. So really our job is to filter out information that's non-essential in the moment and to provide those signals to learners so that they know that something is important and is important to, to absorb. In our webinar in the fall, we did look at something that's called the information processing model. We're not going to go into that in this session. But suffice to say, I think a lot of us are at least intuitively aware of how our mind works when we're trying to learn something or when we're trying to absorb information. So we have a working memory system and that's where it, it, it's short. It only holds information for about 20 seconds. But it's that working memory that allows us to kind of work with this new content to try to make connections with this new content and, and find um, how it connects to what we already know. And there's different ways that students do that. So it can be done through, you know, those direct rehearsal processes. Maybe you're using, you know, mnemonics or, you know, you're taking some notes, making some doodles. Maybe it's even you're, you're visualizing in your mind how this new information connects with what you already know. The main point here is that you're actively, learners are actively working on the new information in some way, shape, or form, even if some of that is happening sort of subconsciously. And it's important for us as presenters to provide the right signals. And that can be visual prompts or auditory prompts to help students absorb uh, the new information. And making those connections to long-term memory is what needs to happen in order for learning to, to truly happen. So learning is really all about those connections. So in terms of PowerPoint design, what are some things that we can do to help provide those signals and to help learners make those connections? One thing that we had reviewed in the fall webinar was this idea of repetition and redundancy. So repetition, of course, we, we know, I think intuitively as teachers, that um, if there's something that's a key message or a key concept, we have to bring it up several times. We need students to have the opportunity to re revisit that concept more than once. So that's kind of the idea of repetition. Now redundancy, the word for this, it comes from cognitive science, so it actually sounds a little bit funny. You know, redundancy almost seems like repetition um, that's unnecessary. But what is intended here in terms of redundancy is the notion of learning happens in a presentation more powerfully when graphics 
and speaking happen together. So what I mean by that is, and I'm sure all of you have maybe seen a TED Talk or maybe you've been to a good presentation where the presenter is speaking and then there's a powerful video um, image, or sorry, a visual image, not a video image. There's a visual image. So the person's speaking and there's a powerful visual image that just work together. And the combination of those two things are very powerful in terms of creating a sort of a lasting uh, connection and long-term memory of that concept. This is in contrast to something that we're so used to doing, especially in PowerPoint, and that is we often will create PowerPoints that will put some images in there, and then we often will put narrative points, uh, narrative bullet points, and then we'll, we'll actually read out those bullet points. And cognitive science has shown that when you have narrative text written out on a slide, as well as uh, the image, then when you have all those three things, it's too much information. That creates a situation of cognitive overload. A key reason that it's exceptionally difficult for learners is that there's a competition between uh, the channels that are operating. So one hand, you're trying to listen to the presenter, and at the same time, you're trying to read what is on the screen. So you can't necessarily listen and read what's on the screen at the same time and then redirect your attention to, you know, the image. Like you're trying to do multiple things at once. Let's look at a, a quick example. And uh, I warn you, this, one, this slide's a little bit hard to look at. I'm going to present this slide as a, a typical kind of traditional lecturer may do so. Okay? So... I'm going to talk to you about the theory of constructivism. This theory assumes that learning is an active process of construction rather than a passive assimilation of information or rote memorization. Jean Piaget is credited for founding constructivism. He has had an influence, a large influence on American schools and schools around the world. So first of all, I'm sure many of you probably felt like, you know, maybe you, you tuned out a little bit while I was reading. But I'm just going to throw a question out there to you and feel free to respond in the chat. Were you able to absorb, you know, key messages from that slide as I was going through it? How did you feel when I presented that slide in the fashion that I did? So feel free to type in just some short thoughts. So I see that several people are typing. So again, I simply read the slide, and uh, I think as, a, as you tend to read, there, there's a little bit of life that just leaves your presentation as soon as that happens. But yeah, so I'm seeing the, yeah, so you felt cognitive overload. I instantly said, whoa, the background was distracting. I got 25% of the content. I was looking at the dog in the, you know, the background wondering what dog it was. <laughs> Wonderful. This is exactly, you know, and, and all of us, you know, I can see like we're processing this a little bit differently, you know, and our attention will wander for different reasons. But um, clearly, it's all impacting us in a negative way. We're not absorbing the key information as we as we should. And then Cassiana is saying, I was further concentrated in reading rather than listening to you. Yes, exactly. And that was the key point I was trying to make that you really can't do all those multiple things at the same time. Multitasking in terms of cognitive tasks is really a, a myth. What you end up doing is you're switching channels, usually from auditory um, to visual in particular. And what's interesting about reading is that it's actually more of an auditory activity anyhow. So a lot of times, I know this is how I read, that a lot of times there's a voice in my head and um, and then I attuned to that voice in my head and not necessarily to, you know, the person in the room. Okay, so then in terms of how maybe we could structure the message so that the 
salient points and the key messages come through. Let's look at the content itself just more specifically. So we're going to remove all of the distracting imagery. It's like, wow, already right there, that's much more breathable in a sense. That's the first thing that comes to mind. You're just less overwhelmed. Now let's think about the content. So first of all, it's a matter of being really vigilant about removing what's not needed in terms of information on a particular slide and sticking with what is absolutely the essential points that you're trying to make. So as a teacher, we're talking in this slide about the theory of constructivism. So really the key message should be what is constructivism. So right off the bat, this autobi or sorry, this biographical information about Jean Piaget. Now, while it might be interesting, doesn't necessarily belong on this slide. In general, I think if we have a rule of thumb where there's one idea per slide, one key idea, then this means that we need to remove this biographical information. If we want to share that with students, if we feel it's important, then we should put that on a different slide. The next piece is that when we look at the first paragraph, we should avoid making this a narrative sentence. Instead, we can pull out what the key words are and keep in mind that we're using these pres presentation slides to support what we are presenting. In which case, these presentation, presentation slides should be aids to the audience and not uh, cue cards for the presenter. So, if we keep that in mind, and we also keep in mind that it's powerful to have a relevant image and a few, you know, and to have someone speak, it's also okay to have a few key words. And again, the idea is to reduce cognitive load. So we can have the word constructivism on its own. We can have the visual, which actually is purposely selected. It actually connotes a sense of that active process of constructing, of building a foundation of understanding. And there's kind of implicit connections that are being made here as well. So constructing and building, seeing that visual of building and seeing that foundation of bricks is subtly sending the message that, you know, learning or in this case, constructivism is maybe a form of learning or creating understanding where you're sort of building knowledge, you're building understanding sort of one piece of information at a time or one connection at a time. And then that last bullet is important, so I keep it in as uh, just a, a reduced amount of text and that key message is that constructivism is not about memorization. So that is one example of how you can Re, you know, really redesign, reimagine what a learning slide can be. It, I think we are so used to wanting to dump all of the information that we want to convey to students, but in, in essence, we can't absorb all of this in the way it's designed. So we have to be vigilant, cut out what's not what's unnecessary, and uh, make sure that we're designing in terms of what we know are the best conditions for learning. So in this case, having a very meaningful image, supporting the key concept, which is the, you know, what constructivism is, and having a few words that describe what it is, can support what you're saying as a presenter to describe that concept in the moment. So my key point here is that we're emphasizing the use of PowerPoint as a visual aid for teaching in the classroom. We are going to touch base a little bit later, the notion of using slides um, as study aids for students as well. And quite often we use our presentation uh, slides as study guides for students. We will share our presentation slides so that students can use them for studying. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. So I'm going to just quickly check in and see how we're we're going, how we're doing here. And uh, great, yeah. So 
And then, Tani, you mentioned, you know, I, I always present in red or bold the most important information, a very clean slide. And that's the idea. You know, I like that that, that description of clean was used because I think it is very relevant. I think the sense of clean comes from space. So there is enough space so that there isn't the sense of clutter. And I think if you can reduce that sense of clutter by adding more space between your elements, just psychologically, your audience will feel a little bit less overwhelmed. Okay. So David just mentioned, sorry, did you just mention you were going to go through how to use the slides as study materials without congesting the slides? Uh, David, yes, but I'm going to go into that a little bit later in the presentation. Okay, so we'll come to that. So we're going to revisit another version of that constructivist slide, but a really terrible, terrible version. So warning, uh, this, I think, slide is actually worse than the previous one, if that's even possible. So let's look at this slide and I'm sorry uh, it's almost seizure inducing I recognize that but what I'd like to do is let's consider the different ways that this slide shows poor slide design so there's a lot of really terrible wrong things happening right now so within the, the chat please start typing out some of those observations what are some things that are just examples of bad design. So yes, so I'm saying, I'm seeing green on red. Absolutely. Green and red, not good for people with color blindness. So we want to avoid that. The background, the background is uh, way too busy. Uh, we talked about that before, but it's incredibly distracting. Color, yes. Now we have to be conscientious with how we use color. So Danielle mentioned you have to use contrast. That's a good point. At the same time, M. Gauthier mentioned there's, if there's too many colors, it's distracting. So again, yes, that can become clutter in itself. So there's a mention of font style, and I'll come back to that. But um, indeed, you want to be selective of the, the kind of fonts you use and not change it up too much. So Humber College, so color, space between the points, font type, background image, good. Yes, that's a good summary. It is incredibly busy. Makes me stressed just looking at it. And let me see, spacing, the information that is highlighted, such as Piaget in yellow. Yeah, I think, I know my eyes are drawn immediately to the John Piaget in yellow, but it's really not the most important element on that slide. Too wordy, indeed, so like we had mentioned before. Also, all the words are in narrative form. So points to what we had mentioned uh, previously. OK, so Cassiana said green on red are complementary colors, aren't they? Is that why they're not good together? The green and the red, they're not good together because people can have, especially men, can have green red color blindness which means that they have trouble distinguishing the difference between green and red so in this case it means that they're they're not they're going to be seeing green and red sort of similarly in which case it lacks contrast and they may not be able to read the text that's overlaid on the red so that's why it's just very difficult for people with red green blindness to be able to read the text on the background And I'm just reading here. So overall, looks too um, juvenile. You know, what's the point of the background image? Exactly. What is the relevance of the image? It's intended to be decorative, but again, in being decorative, doesn't need to be there because it actually only serves to create distraction. It it actually takes attention away from what is important, which is describing what the theory of constructivism is. So it's a distraction. So yes, I agree, it looks very juvenile. Um, <laughs> yes, and Piaget is confused about the slide. I agree, he does look rather confused. 
Yeah, so there's lots of great comments here. So there's text box, you know, it's not centered. Yeah, it is also there's that sense of unbalance. And it's interesting, Danielle, um, your question, you ask if the title is animated. And it might appear that way because I think it's how our eyes are trying to process the green on the red and just the vibrancy of the bright green on the gray, bright red that it actually looks like maybe it's uh, vibrating a little bit. So yeah, like there's an illusion of, of movement. So yeah, all of these are very, very good observations, very good points. I'm just going to um, review some of those. Um, just point by point so that uh, we can kind of summarize all the great points that you are, are making. So first of all, let's start from the top. So we have, we already talked about the color scheme of green on red and why that's not good for color blindness. Uh, we spoke about the importance of contrast. We do want to be judicious with the colors that we use. We want to use different colors sparingly. It's good to have a little bit of variety of color, but to use it in very particular way. So for instance, um, a lot of us had that the yellow Jean Piaget kind of jumped out on us. Um, now that's good, except that now we're, our eyes are being drawn to an element that's not important to the slide. It's not important to the key message. So you have to be careful in using color for the right kind of emphasis. Having said that, um, in terms of visuals and font, another point was made about font choice. So some, some people may already be aware of this, um, but it's certainly best practices in terms of web design, that when you are designing a pa a materials for the web, and that includes PowerPoints, that instead of using a serif font, now what we're looking at is an example of a serif font. The serif fonts, tend to have like the little hats or little flourishes at the end of the letters, those little things right, right there. And that works really well for print materials, but when you're looking at things on the web, uh, it tends to be a little bit less uh, easy to process. Uh, so the recommendation, the rule of thumb, is generally use like a sans serif. Now, this isn't the best example of a sans serif, but it is one, and that's the Jean Piaget. You'll notice that there's no little flourishes. So it actually is easier to read. Now this particular choice of font, it's comic um, sans serif, and it does end up making things look a little bit juvenile and less professional. So again, you wanna make sure that your font choice is um, more you know, on the, I would say, professional sort of realm of things. If I just go back just briefly to the previous slide, this is an example of uh, son, son serif. So there's no little flourishes. And it tends to be a little bit easier for our, our minds to, to absorb and for us to kind of decode. So that's a little bit about font. It's always a good idea to not have a busy background. We spoke about that. Another thing that's problematic about this particular slide is just there's not a sense of balance. So you, your eyes are kind of bouncing all over the place. So you want to just be mindful of how you know people tend to look at slides. So a lot of times, especially you know if it's kind of structured like this, um, you know, our eyes are like, okay, well, that, that's bright yellow, we're going here, and then, okay, well, maybe we're distracted by these elements, and then, okay, but that's the title, so we're looking at that. But then the image is so big, so that also captures our interest. And then lastly, we, we get to, you know, the content. So just keep in mind how, you know, you want people to go, you know, go to, through the information, and that comes down to this concept of uh, sequencing information, and we're going to explore that a little bit more in a moment. So I'm going to present another possibility in terms of presenting this slide. And again, I wouldn't say that there's any one absolute, you know, best or top way of uh, presenting information. But um, this is just another option. I think we've been told and it's been hammered into our heads that you shouldn't have a lot of presentation slides. And I want to debunk that myth because when you are presenting, I would argue that 
the number of slides doesn't really matter because you're going to be going through those slides at a different pace. So the most important thing is to not overwhelm people in any particular moment. So you're, it's, you're better off to pace out and, and spread out information across several slides. So for instance, we could, for instance, introduce the concept of constructivism with the big image. So maybe you're talking to your students and you say something like, you know, we're going to talk about constructivism. So then you prime learners with this visual that implicitly gives the message about, you know, learning being about constructing knowledge and that you're trying to build from an, a foundation of what you already know. And then you simply have the word constructivism. Then the next slide could be something like this, where, you know, the term, it's repeated because it's important. Even the image is repeated. But now you've seen that image before, so you can go to the right and focus on the key ideas, which is what constructivism is. It's about constructing understanding, not memorization. So again, that's another possibility. And again, I think you're probably, I would imagine, you know, struck by just how much space there is and how much less information and clutter there is. And at the end of the day, that's the most important thing you can do for your students in this moment of learning, and that is to remove what doesn't need to be there. Okay, so yeah, I'm just quickly reading the chat. And um, yes, so no serif font is not accessible, only sans serif font is accessible. So thanks, Jennifer. So you mentioned those fonts such as Arial, Tahoma, Open Body Sans, etc. So lots of those available you know, within the Microsoft Office suite. Uh, the white text box cutting into the red title boxes is killing me. <laughs> Sorry, that was you know, referencing the previous slide. Uh, yes, that previous slide here. So again, yeah, discongruency, right? That discongruency really throws us off. <laughs> Thank you for that comment. I'm going to go on um, to our next concept. Um, so we had alluded to this importance of sequencing of information, and I'd introduced the notion that it's actually okay to spread out ideas from you know, one slide to the next. I recognize that um, quite often when we're teaching, there might be charts that or models of things that are in chart form that we want to convey. So just as an example, so here is a, a chart of the information processing model. So this is an example that, you know, there's a lot of information going on here. There's different ways that you can present this within your, your PowerPoint. Um, one possibility is you can use something that's called a, kind of a slow reveal. So I'll quickly share, you one, uh, share with you one technique that I use for that. So one, you know, technique is I could use um, these shapes and I could, let's say, grab that shape, and I, I can cover up what I don't want present in that slide. So right now, I've drawn the shape. If I click on it, I can change the fill color. So I'm going to grab the eyedropper. I'm going to select the color of the background, remove the outline. And I recognize I'm probably going through this a bit fast. Um, at the end of it, I, you know, I'm happy to maybe talk about you know, maybe some resources for you know, tutorials about PowerPoint. But again, I just want to give you a, a, what's possible. So then if I click away, all of a sudden you don't see that particular piece of information. Previously, I had done the same for that part. You know, again, like I wanted to simplify you know, what's on the screen at any one point. So I can keep doing that. I can, cop I can end up like copying, you know, pasting these little boxes. And then right away, you're covering up a lot of that non-essential information. So you can make a process of that and even do it such that maybe I only want sensory um, memory to, to show up. So I can just make this box basically block out everything. And that's my first slide. I can duplicate this slide. So I'm just going to go to the thumbnails and then select that. I right-click, I duplicate. 
And if I go to the second one, then I can just kind of reveal the next part. So maybe, you know, I want that part, you know, to, to be revealed. And, um, you, know, the you know, as you get to know PowerPoint, you realize, for instance, this little element, um, you know, I, it's partly obscured by that object. So if I click on it, and I can right click, and then I can bring to the front, then um, everything is in its proper order. So then when you go to present, then you start with um, your first element. So you can talk about sensory memory and how that's the first kind of stage or piece of the information processing model. Then you can go to the next step in terms of you know, how information enters sensory memory, then goes to the working memory, and so on. So that's just one example of kind of a gradual reveal kind of process. Another thing that we could do is just use the design tools available within PowerPoint. So for instance, if I create a new slide, I can just manually create, create these pieces. So if I create using the shapes, so on the home bar, there's uh, the shape uh, area here. So I can just draw a box and then you know, you type in your first item. Let's say, oops, sensory memory, you know, et cetera. Then I can, you know, create the next one and, and so on. So I think we're aware of those kind of, you know, graphic tools within Brightspace. You know, you can change the color, you know, et cetera. And right now we're staying on one slide. So then this is where, of course, you know, animation can come in if you want. So we've got these, uh, if I click on the animation tab, then you can have, you know, appearances. So, you know, for instance, I can select appear. And if I have your animation pane and um, so, you know, I just click and then the next item appears. So there's that aspect as well. So I think many of us are aware of, of those tools. Another possibility I'll just quickly mention, and I won't spend much time on this, is of course there's the smart art. So then we have here, there's already different graphics for presenting relationships between things. So I could you know, easily select one of these, you know, let's say this one. And then I just add, you know, my information. I can change the color, et cetera. Now, if you are, we're going to, the next thing we're going to talk about is converting, let's say, your, your visual slides into something you would want to share with your students as notes. Uh, we'll talk a few minutes about that. But the only thing about using the smart art is that if you want to save the, your PowerPoint says, let's say, um, you, if you want to save it, you know, as handouts or, you know, especially in, in notes or handout format. In terms of accessibility and screen reading, screen readers have difficulty reading smart art. So it's important from accessibility perspective that you, if you use this, then you do need to ha add what's called alternate text. So I think we know. Well, anyways, I'm assuming that many of us have been exposed to the idea of alt text or alternate text. We typically need to add alternate text to images. So for example, if I go back to this constructivist slide, to make this sort of accessible to screen readers, it would be important that I add alt text. And so one way to add alternate text is I can click on the image, and um, I often right click or you can click on format, but uh, I still like to right click. And I'm just gonna go close my animation pane because I want the formatting to appear. And now I'm gonna do format picture. And under format picture, this is, it's a, not a clear path to alt text, but I have to go to format picture and then the third icon, and then the last item is alt text and then you can put in your description of what is happening in that scene. So the same goes with the use of SmartArt. So I'd have to click on the SmartArt 
and then the same thing under the format shape then I would have to click on this little icon the last one and then select alt text and put in my description so unfortunately there's really no way around that in terms of, of screen reading I will say that the same would apply to all these graphics here as well um, from a screen reader pers um, kind of perspective I would need to make sure that um, every slide I'm just putting just the right amount of information probably what I would do in this case if I want to convert this to let's say um, a PDF version of uh, st study notes for students that can be read by a screen reader then I would probably make sure that all of this uh, has an explanation within the notes section what's great about the notes section is and you can see these are some of my own personal notes but if you're preparing your PowerPoints, if you put kind of the key kind of speaking points or the key kind of messages that you want to convey on each slide, if you save this as a, basically as like a handout, and then you save that handout as PDF, then it is possible for screen readers to read these notes. So that would be my suggestion. I'm gonna quickly show you how you can save um, this as um, a PDF version of some student uh, notes. So for instance, if we go to File and we go to Print, then what you want to do is under here, you, by default it's set to print all slides, but what we can do is we can, um, oh sorry, that's the wrong area, my apologies. We want uh, click the default, which is full page slides. So we can see that there are other options. So for instance, you can click on notes page. And you'll see that the notes page actually will show you have in your notes section. So of course, if I was to share this slide deck with my students, if I wanted to make them as study notes, then I would certainly tie up my speaking notes and make sure that they are readable and understandable to my students as, as notes. And what's brilliant as well is that you can print this um, as a PDF and so you would need to make sure that you have like a print to PDF option within PowerPoint and you can talk to your ITS folks to help you with that but you can save it to PDF and the screen readers will read the text on it. so that's you know another option that you could read you could resort to so just in summary and I do this in my online course I will create my um, and well, this goes for my online course, but when I teach in class, my basic workflow is that I will create my presentation slides. I will remove most of the content that's text heavy from my main slides, but then I'll have my, my notes within the notes section. Then I can say, I can basically save those as notes and then print as a PDF and I can share that, that PDF in my LMS and then that's a version for students um, and it does, from my experience, uh, screen readers are able to read the notes in the notes section. So what I just described to you is this kind of workflow from having a presentation that you would use to deliver your lesson in class and then converting that to notes that your students could use um, you know, as notes and you can provide those within your LMS. I'm just going to check back, you know, with everybody to to see how things are are do. How, yeah, I'll see how things are, how people are doing. So, I'm just going to go back to our comment section, and this does refer to, I guess, a. a previous slides so then Jennifer had meant that um, italics are not accessible so you need to emphasize anything and use bold and set instead so that's a very good point Jennifer so if we're talking about creating emphasis and I'll go back to let's say a slide sort of like um, this one and it's interesting yeah so screen readers don't pick up italics and that's an interesting point to make so it will point out um, the emphasis of the bolding in terms of about, but not the italics. 
So in this case, this emphasis is, you know, maybe to the benefit of the individuals that are attending sort of face to face. But yeah, for the screen reader, the screen reader will be blind to the italics that are presented here. So thank you, Jennifer. That's a really, really good point. So Jeanette mentioned, I'm very fascinated with the animations. And uh, certainly there's uh, some options and possibilities you know, with um, animations. Of course, like any kind of feature or tool you know, within um, PowerPoint, you don't want to overwhelm with animation. So I think you want to be judicious. And keep in mind, if you want to follow that workflow of presentation slides you use in person and converting those to um, let's say a PDF sort of slide notes that you would share with your students in an LMS, then the animations may get in the way of that process. It just means you may have to spend a bit more time um, even removing those animations because, um, for instance, if you have a slide where you click to reveal each piece, then when you save as a PDF, then that slide will probably look blank. So anyways, just a, a caveat around that. So Paolo has a question. So um, about animations, what do you think about Prezi or similar alternatives? So this is a question that comes up a lot. You know, is Prezi good or, um, you know, what do you think about Prezi as it relates to PowerPoint? Certainly there's a novelty element to Prezi. I think we've had decades now of PowerPoint and even the, con the, the convention of seeing the slides with the bullets we almost have this you know, subconscious reaction that we want to turn our brains off. We have this sense of dread of, no, not another PowerPoint with bullets. So even just from a pure novelty perspective, a lot of you know, teachers like to use Prezi within their classroom presentation just because it's, um, it looks different for students. A lot of um, teachers like that it doesn't force a linear structure through a presentation. So you can kind of jump in um, and, and zoom in on whatever point you want at that moment. And you don't have to go kind of backwards from one slide to the next. So that's seen as benefits to a lot of people. Uh, Jennifer mentions, we need to be mindful of animations as well. There is an accessibility concern. Too much movement can be very distracting and tiring on the eyes. Thank you, Jennifer, because that indeed is a very important consideration. And you can imagine, yeah, if all of a sudden we dumped using PowerPoint and it was all about Prezi, that format becomes fatiguing. And then that becomes a different kind of sort of information, you know, experience of feeling overwhelmed. So cognitively you become tired for different reasons. So that's a very good point. So thanks for mentioning that, Jennifer. Yeah, and Dawn, you say less is always more. And I agree. I totally agree with that. I think that is a key message that you can take away from this entire presentation, that I think less is more. Less is often more effective in terms of having pre PowerPoint presentation slides to support your key messages and not get in the way of what you're trying to convey. So Tanya, you're asking, what about including, for example, one to 10 points, or is it better to divide these into two slides? Uh, Tanya, I think my inclination would be to divide into two slides. Though I want to say it depends what those bullet points are. I like to think more of, you know, what is the concept what is the idea that you're trying to convey and work with that concept? And if the concept is a more complicated one, like if you're trying to explain how the process of um, information you know, management works, if you're trying to describe the information processing model, then there's different components to that. So you're better off separating those, those separate ideas on separate slides. So I think if you take the stance that you try to limit your slide to one idea, 
And if you're explaining a concept that is made of several ideas, then you want to sequence those ideas out. You want to kind of build from one point to the next and make those connections uh, sequentially. And I think if you have that across several slides, that's probably the most effective way of doing that, in my personal opinion. So I hope that helps, Tanya. So we have thought, actually you have maybe about three or four minutes left. So I'm going to continue to take questions, but what I'll do is I imagine, you know, some people have to start slipping away from, from our session, but I want to thank everyone for, for attending today. I'm going to leave you with my contact. Well, first of all, let me quickly leave you with resources. There is more information about how to create accessible PowerPoints if you go to the WebAIM website. And I have a link here, but you can also Google it. Just Google webaim.org. They're an organization dedicated to accessibility on the web. And they have some really well-organized tips for how to make your PowerPoints more accessible. Also wanted to share a tip that I've um, recently been using. There's a screen reader that's called NVDA, or N NVIDA, I think it's referred to as. And you can download this for free on your computer. And it's kind of nice to do a, a test of the PowerPoints, the final versions that you're going to be sharing with your students as slides. So that can be a really helpful uh, resource to you as well. There's certainly other tips and other considerations that you need to factor in from an accessibility standpoint. I only just barely brushed the, the, the surface. There are things such as being aware of slide order in the order of your elements. So for instance, um, there's something that's called um, your selection pane. And when you display that, it shows you the order that a screen reader is going to read your elements. And it goes from the bottom to the top. So then if I click on text box, this means that the screen reader is going to read my title, and then it's going to read the next content. Certainly when you have more objects, that becomes really important. So for instance, um, right now the screen reader, you know, if I have alt text, it's going to read this image, then that one, and then the arrow, which is not right. You want to have this image followed by the arrow, and then the last image. So then you can switch things around to make sure that the screen reader can read the alt text properly on these elements. Anyways, once again, there's no shortage of uh, sort of accessibility tips that you can get into, but um, certainly this website is a good resource. And also you can do a Google search for Microsoft and accessibility in PowerPoint, and they provide you know, some, some of the technical how-tos of what you can do within PowerPoint. Lastly, I'm going to share my contact information. So feel free to reach out, send me an email if you have any other questions. And um, I am on Twitter. Um, I post periodically. Um, so yeah, um, you can also connect with me there. But we are getting close to one. Well, actually, we're one o'clock on the dot. So I will be here a little bit longer. Uh, feel free to stay online, and I'm happy to continue you know, answering questions. But for everyone that has to run, I want to thank you all for being here, and I uh, hope to see you at some of our other uh, webinar sessions in the future. So take care and enjoy that fresh spring air. Uh, we're having a lovely day here in Ottawa. And I hope that where you are, it's also, e uh, also uh, equally as, as pleasant. Yeah, no, thank you very much you know, once again, everyone. And uh, I will hang in there. Just in case there's other questions, maybe I'll just go back and review just to see if I missed anything. I think I've captured everyone's questions. Oh, thank you, Sonia. I'm glad that it was a good addition to the concepts we reviewed in the fall. Please share the links again. Okay, yes, I will do that right now. So we'll, will we be uh, posting this on the website, the recording? Oh, yes. Thank you for, for mentioning that. So yes, absolutely. This recording will be posted uh, on the EdTech Ontario website. 
And um, just for convenience, I can add that link once again. So it's ed tech Ontario. And just look under webinars. There'll be links to past webinars, and that's where the recordings are. Okay, okay well, thank, thank you. you. I'm going to be on my way. Yeah, well, I am so appreciative that you were here to, to help sort out some of the troubleshooting issues. So I'm very grateful. So thanks for, for being there to help me. No problem. Take care. Yes, you too. Oh, thanks, Catherine. I appreciate that. Yeah, I can see that there were quite a few folks from Algonquin here today, so that makes me quite happy. Oh, Tanya, yes, I'm happy to show that to you once again. Not a problem. I know I went through that quite quickly. So let me go back to the slide. I'm just going to delete what I had put there before. So the idea is that in PowerPoint, you can use your shape tool, and then you can kind of try to make that shape tool blend into the background. And then in that way, you can kind of mask or block certain things from being visible. So for instance, if I just want this sensory memory box to be what is shown at this moment, then what I can do is I'll click, so I'm on the Home tab, and I'll click the box tool and then I can draw a box. So I just want, let's say this piece to disappear. Now the default color is blue. So I'm going to change that color. So I'm going to click on the object. Um, first of all, I'll close out that pane, selection pane. I don't need that anymore. Um, but I'll just show you when you click on, okay, I'm just going to close all of this. So I drew the box when I click on it. Then if I go up to where it says format, if I click on format, I see options that pop up on the ribbon. But what I like to do is if I right click, so I'm using a, a like a Microsoft um, you know, PC, I'm not using a Mac. If I right click on the shape, I like to go straight to format shape, which is at the bottom of that right click menu. Then what I can do is I have options to change the color. So then here beside color is the drop down. And what I can do is click the eyedropper. So what happens is with my object still selected, I click on the background with my eyedropper. And that changes the box to the same color as the background. Now I can't stop there because if I click away, there's still the outline of the box. So I click on the box itself, and the format shape box is still there. I can, I need to find 
the line attributes area. So there it is at the bottom. If I expand it, here's the option where I can say I don't want a line. So I'll click on no line. And now if I click away, it disappears. So now I have this block. Why do I want to block out everything except for sensory memory? Then I can, the easiest way to do that is if I click on this box and I can, and I love using right click, I can right click and I can copy and then I can paste. And I'm just doing, let's say, with my right click and I can paste the picture and there it is. And I can grab this picture and put it wherever I want. So there it is. Uh, these little bounding boxes mean that I can click and then expand. So then that covers that. Now I can keep going and I'll share with you another quick tip. If I just want to duplicate that shape with that shape selected, I can do control D. So control D means duplicate. So now I just made a second copy of that shape. So I can click and drag that over to here. And then I can just sort of drag to reshape that. And I can continue doing all of that. So I'll do this one more, control D. And um, there's going to be a big box. I'm just going to cover all of this. And then move this down. And there you go. So now with your one slide, you just have sensory memory listed as the image. Now, I can copy, if I want to work on the next slide in this sequence, there is the thumbnail area of PowerPoint. So I have the slide selected in the thumbnail view. If I, again, right click, I can go to duplicate the slide. So now I have the same version of that slide. But with this version, I'm going to remove that big box. So I'm going to click on the gray area. I can, well, I can delete it, or I can just, if I drag that, I can move it over. And maybe this is the area that I want to hide. So maybe I'm OK with this content here. Um, now you can see this 20 seconds, um, there's a part of it that's obscured because this, block, this box is over top of it. So this is where we get to consider the the order of objects. So if I click on this object, again, I can right click. And these two items here, bring the front, bring the back. That helps you to change the layering of where things are positioned. So there's kind of a stacking order of these objects. So I have the object selected. If I want to bring it all the way to the front, then I just go bring to front. And now that's on the very top. And that means it's over top of this gray box. And that's basically how it can work. So then, you know, there's my first slide. I can, you know, as an instructor, talk about sensory memory. Then maybe next step, I start talking about working memory. And I can, you know, go further, you know, and build out from there. Does that make sense? I hope that helps. Hopefully that breaks it down a bit more. Good. Okay, thank you very much. I'm glad that that was something that uh, you could take away with you. Perfect. Okay, so I think I will stop the recording.